All right, I think leading on from a corner's presentation, we've, we, it, it flows very nicely that we're now going to have a presentation from Impor, which is specifically covering what South Africa is doing in terms of blockchain and the presidential commission around um, the 4RR. So if you can please welcome up Impor on the stage, and he's going to share some thoughts on that. Thank you. We are also going to focus, yes, on the fourth industrial revolution, get into blockchain in the most meaningful way, the internet of things. And uh, they spoke extremely well. What they were saying was both moving, it was engaging, it was touching, very touching. Somebody was watching it online, on stream, overseas sent me a message on my cell phone and said this is most touching it was also informative because i think many of us will have learned a lot from blockchain to cryptocurrency to all those things most most uh, informative author and amongst various other enterprises he is developing the first good morning ladies and gentlemen that was an interesting clip of the president saying we're looking into blockchain and cryptocurrency. A lot of people asked me straight after that conference to say, how did you get the president to say something like that? And I always say to them that it was very simple because the president himself is very knowledgeable of cryptocurrencies and blockchain technologies. It was very simple to talk to him about it and for him to understand the concept. Uh, my name is Mpo Dagada and I'm a member of the presidential commission on the fourth industrial revolution. And basically what we do, or what we're tasked to do, is to develop a strategy for South Africa to be globally competitive when it comes to the fourth industrial revolution. A multi-sectoral strategy where we're looking at different sectors working together to actually achieve this and help the country grow its GDP and the country actually grow itself further. When we started at this commission, we had a lot of feedback from different people from all around the world saying all sorts of different things. For me, the first thing was a very serious attack on the credibility of South Africa going for the fourth industrial revolution. And I think I had a few moments to myself to ask myself the question of why is it that people are so attacking when it comes to the fourth industrial revolution? And some of the big attacks came to say, but South Africa is still very much in the second industrial revolution where we're still struggling with electricity, where ESCOM is not functioning. How dare we look at the fourth industrial revolution when we still have these problems? And in the beginning, I saw it as an attack, but as time went by, I began to realize that actually, people have got a point. We do have issues, and we do need to fix these issues. And the question then came about to say, do we rebrand and call ourselves the second industrial revolution commission? Do we rebrand and call ourselves the third industrial revolution? Or do we spearhead and go on forward to actually try and fix this? And I, I decided to go back into history to actually research what happens when a country decides to take any sort of revolution seriously? What are the repercussions? What actually happens when this happens? And when we looked at the first industrial revolution, which brought us the steam engine, which many of us are aware of, and I won't go into too much detail as to what each industrial revolution brought us, we found that the steam engine only arrived in South Africa 60 years after it had been functioning in places like Europe, etc. So it took South Africa 60 years, or rather Africa, to get involved in the first industrial revolution. And what we realized is that countries that actually got inv involved within each revolution early, took advantage of it and planned for it, actually became the most prosperous countries in that day and age. So in the day and age when it was the first industrial revolution, it was the countries that actually adopted this new technology that actually became the wealthiest and most powerful countries within that day and age. And when we look at the second industrial revolution, which brought us many things like electricity, but also brought us the aeroplane, we found that the first aeroplane only landed in South Africa and subsequently Africa, again, 60 years after it actually landed in America. Now we ask ourselves the question that when we look at these specific technologies, what is it about these industrial revolutions that cause these countries to actually become prosperous? And we find that it is actual planning that went into it, but not only planning, participation and actual engagement of each of these revolutions that caused these countries to become successful at these revolutions. And when we look at the third industrial revolution, which brought us amazing things like the internet, which many people confuse for the fourth industrial revolution, but it is indeed a third industrial revolution technology. 
We found that it took seven years until the internet landed in South Africa, or rather Africa. Now, when we look at the terms of reference when it comes to each of these industrial revolutions, we find that each and every country had planned, and those that didn't plan came up with a plan as they saw this change happen to compete and become effective within that revolution, except for African countries. African countries were the only countries in each revolution that weren't actively engaged in these revolutions and subsequently had to wait for somebody from these other countries to land on the African continent and bring us this new technology. And when we looked at this, it gave us more encouragement to say, although we do have issues, and we can't ignore the issues that we have as South Africa, it's important for us to actually engage and start to plan and think about the Fourth Industrial Revolution. And that's when the commission was launched in 2019. And when the commission was launched, we actually discovered something very interesting. That all other countries, or well, first world countries, or countries outside of Africa, we're all done with their strategies for the fourth industrial revolution. So in actual fact, we were a little bit late to actually start the commission. And that's when we said we cannot waste any further time by looking at what the critics are saying, but we need to forge ahead and develop a strategy that will actually be effective and work for the African continent. And that's when we set up the fourth industrial revolution commission within the presidency. And basically, the task is to say, how do we compete effectively within the fourth industrial revolution? We went on a journey to study different countries and the different strategies that they've got for the fourth industrial revolution. One that I found quite interesting that I'll share very briefly is Germany's strategy. I'll be moving very quickly to try and get as much in as possible due to time. When we looked at Germany, their aim was to drive decentralized digital manufacturing, which I found to be very interesting. Their emphasis was superior and efficient manufacturing. The strategy, which is a, a country strategy that they've got, is advancing Germany as a global innovation leader. And what I found very interesting in all the different strategies that they've got, they want to introduce what they call individualized medicine. And this medicine is medicine specifically created for your specific gene pool. So what they do is they study the type of air you're breathing, type of area you live in, the food you're eating, and they want to put that on a blockchain and actually start to produce medicine specifically designed to you, your gene pool, what your family has suffered in the past, the food you're eating, the air you're breathing, etc., and to make that medicine more effective. And they're doing this because they've got a big issue where the population is actually an aging population, most of the population is. So they're trying to preserve them and keep them longer and more effective for a longer period of time. And this is some of the technology that they're doing through a blockchain. Now, when we looked at South Africa and we looked at the problems we, we have in the country, we realized that we actually need to engage within this new revolution more than anyone else. Because obviously, the bigger the problems you've got, the bigger the solutions you need to actually fix those problems. When we look at our country, this is from the World Bank. There were some serious accusations by the World Bank about us not sourcing the information that they give us as government. And this information specifically shows us the fixed broadband subscriptions per 100 people in South Africa. The South Africa is the blue line, and the red line is the rest of the world. And as you can see, South Africa is not doing very well as compared to the rest of the world. And South Africa, being a leader in Africa, depicts what's happening with the rest of Africa. So if South Africa is not doing very well when it comes to fixed broadband, it clearly shows us that the rest of the world, the rest of Africa, is not doing well as well. And when we looked at the mobile cellular subscriptions per 100 people, we saw the opposite, that South Africa is doing better than the rest of the world. So we began to ask ourselves this question to say, what is actually going on in South Africa? Is everybody deciding to buy cell phones and nothing else? And when we looked at the different landscapes of Africa, we noticed that that's why systems like M-Pesa thrive so well. Because in Africa, the adoption of cellular mobile subscriptions is actually increasing at a very rapid rate. And the rest of the world is looking at it to say, we have an opportunity here where we're seeing that Africans are very engaged within mobile cellular than anything else. And when we looked at this, we realized that the aptitude for Africans to engage with technology is actually there we need to actually fix where the issues lie, which some of the issues is the internet. When we look at the economy, the South African economy, we realize two big challenges that we need to solve. The first one is reduce unemployment, as we're all aware, and the second one is to increase our GDP. 
we looked at bringing in policy that will actually help create an inclusive growing economy. And the reason I say inclusive is because South Africa happens to have, and even Africa, one of the most non-inclusive economies in the world where we've got majority of the people who are actually living in poverty. When we look at our weaknesses, we realize that global competitive is a weakness, the ease of doing business in South Africa, inequality, which I've just mentioned, and a high unemployment rate. And worst of all, it's the highest when it comes to the youth. We needed to create policy around the fourth industrial revolution that will actually help and fix these four big issues that we've got in South Africa. When we looked at our strength, we looked at the strengths and realize that the strengths point us to one way and one way only. Our natural resources is our strength. Our continental economic and political powerhouse of South Africa being the leader in Africa. And not only that, but also South Africa taking the chairmanship of the African Union, as the president is now the chairman of the African Union. And a mature financial services sector. We're sitting in Investec, so I'll give them the compliment of saying we've got some of the best banks in the world. When we look at our strengths and we look at how we can leverage four IR technologies to help these strengths, we realize a very easy roadmap that can actually be created. And these are some of the solutions that at a high level, government is looking into to say, how do we actually create these solutions? This is a bit of some gossip, but I'll share it. We received some engagement from Elon Musk saying he wants to start mining as Tesla, because they're experiencing some production issues within Tesla to actually meet the demand that they've actually got. So Tesla wants to cut out the middleman and actually get into the dumps and start mining for their lithium batteries, etc. Now, when we look at the interest all around the world, we realize that the world is very interested in minerals in Africa. We're all aware of it. And when we look at our GDP, we realize that our GDP, and the reason why we've got a a GDP that's continually growing, or a GDP that's done well, is because of our minerals. How about we put a blockchain system to fix our minerals in South Africa? But not only fix our minerals, attract capital, keep a record that will actually prove to the rest of the world that we're not corrupt when it comes to minerals, and open up the market to not only the sophisticated JSC shareholder, but to anybody who can buy a cryptocurrency coin to anybody who can plug in to a blockchain system. How about we create a value system where when we look at a mineral like chromium or chrome, which South Africa has reserves of about 70% of the global supply of chrome, we've got a South Africa. How about putting that in a blockchain system and allowing different people from all over the world to plug in? Not only from a capital perspective, but also from a mineral perspective, end-to-end -end usership on a blockchain system. And these are some of the solutions that we're realizing that if done properly, if implemented properly, if we've got people that can look into it and do it in an efficient way, we can have companies like Tesla plug and play into those systems and we'll be able to boost our economy. But obviously this cannot be done if not done properly. It cannot be done. And the reason why I'll explain this is because we actually need to get the country ready to do it properly. We need the person in the community to understand that by them striking and having a mine on a blockchain system which actually works through tech, it could affect them very quickly because with a blockchain system, people are able to see the data in a three-dimensional data space and make decisions on the investment which could harm them forever. But for us to get to that level, we need to make sure that every citizen in the country is aware and educated to that level. For us to get to the community and speak to the chief and say, we're going to put this mine on a blockchain system, and as soon as we launch it, capital will flow from all around the world, which will enable everything to happen efficiently, quickly, on a record. We need to get the chief, his headman, and that community well educated about how that actually works. But not only that, we need to get them to understand blockchain technology. Because for them to engage with it and actually be proactive and active into it, they need to understand it. So these are some of the underlying problems that allow us to dream at that level, but we need to fix these problems before we can even get there. And this is where the blockchain technology community within South Africa and in Africa needs to be active about telling everybody about this good message of blockchain to say we can actually create 
something quite amazing. The founder of the World Economic Forum said something which resonated very well with me. He said, I'm convinced of one thing, that in the future, talent, more than capital, will represent the critical factor of production. And this is when the commission has decided to say we need to reskill almost every citizen within South Africa. Because we're realizing that in the future, it will be more about what you know, the talent which you have, than anything else. And that will be the critical factor in anything. So that's one of the big resolutions that the commission has taken to say, we need to make sure that each and every program in South Africa, be it the CETAs, be it the universities, be it every institution, be it every single system, we need to reskill our people and make sure that our talent pool is very strong more than anything. When we look at the different models of functionality, when it came to the first, second, third, and fourth industrial revolution, we noticed that in the first and second industrial revolution, everything was very centralized. We sort of had one company running everything, everybody was sort of plugged into that system, and even in the second industrial revolution, we had the same thing. In the third industrial revolution, things sort of started to get decentralized, in the term of people saying decentralized, because a blockchain person might disagree with me. But in the third industrial revolution, we sort of saw different corporates come on board and actually power moving into these decentralized pools, Google having its own data, Facebook having its own data, etc. But in the fourth industrial revolution, we're moving on to a more de distributed network where we allow everybody to sort of own their own data. When we looked at the UK and some of the policies that they've got there, in the UK, if you've got a bank account number, apologies, Investec, if you've got a bank account number in the UK and you decide to move from one bank to the other, you're allowed to move with your bank account number because that data belongs to you and not the bank. And in the UK, they're rolling out more information about data to say, who truly owns data? Where should this data sit? We cannot put this data with government because that actually puts the data itself at risk of hacking and being manipulated, etc. Who should own data? And this is where blockchain comes in place. To say the world is looking at actually putting data into that. And this is where even government is looking at. Because when we had our meetings and we asked ourselves a very significant question within government to say, who owns the most data when it comes to South Africans in the world? We realize that it's not actually government. Is it Facebook? Is it Google? Is it the banks? I won't answer that. But what we need to look for is solutions that are going to help us decentralize and distribute this data and allow the individual to own the data. And these are some of the big policy statements that are being worked on currently in government to say we need to fix the data issue. Not only data in terms of data must fall in terms of the data prices, but data in terms of ownership. Who owns it and who's allowed to do what with it? And at what stage do we allow the person to monetize that data? At what tax? Do we implement on that data? How do we make sure that that data is not manipulated? And these are the sort of questions that need answers. And as we all know in this room, that blockchain can answer these questions in a very simple way. 84% of companies, according to PwC, are actively involved within blockchain technology. And we're seeing headlines like Volkswagen to track mineral supply chains using IBM blockchain. And again, I pose to you this question that if our strength as Africans is minerals and the rest of the world is looking to track these minerals through an IBM blockchain, we need to be educated about how to use blockchain within the mineral space. And that's in South Africa. Most of it is in the rural areas. Data is the new oil. When I was preparing this, this, this presentation, I wanted to change the slide and put that down and put the price of oil currently because it is quite something interesting. But data is the new oil. And data is the new oil that fuels artificial intelligence. And blockchain technology works hand in hand with artificial intelligence, and this is what the world is moving towards. I was laughing with a friend of mine when we read a document from Russia where President Vladimir Putin's daughter is now the head of Russia's Artificial Intelligence Institute. So Russia has now set up an artificial intelligence institute that looks to advise each and every person and company in Russia on how they can leverage artificial intelligence to do and become better as a country when they compete with the rest of the world. I said to a friend of mine that if the president of South Africa 
son was to be the head of that. We'd have a lot of media, um, Lou. But in Russia, it seems nobody wants to disrespect, disrespect President Vladimir Putin. But this is a very interesting point that the government is looking into to say, how do we ensure that data is not manipulated by artificial intelligence? I had a conversation with the CEO of Vodacom, and it was very interesting because he said to me that they've implemented artificial intelligence into their systems at Vodacom. And he said that some of the data that they're able to pick up on is that everybody who wakes up before 5 a.m. or at 5 a.m. is not a good target to market airtime advance to them because they generally don't buy airtime advance. Everybody who wakes up after 5 a.m. or rather later on 6, 7, 8 are actually a good target to market airtime advance. I don't know if people here know airtime advance. <laughs> Maybe this is a good crowd. Airtime advance is where people sort of get a loan on their airtime. So when they run out of airtime, they actually get a loan on it. And then when they buy airtime, they pay back that loan. So it's like a loan of airtime. So through this artificial intelligence mechanism, they were able to get that information from that, and they're using that information to make more profit because they're able to market exactly to who they know will be able to buy their product. And if governments are not moving quick enough to catch up on this and regulate this, we'll have a big problem where everybody who's got an artificial intelligence system and is using it to the best of their ability will become the most profitable. And that might in itself have a moral issue behind it which is something everybody needs to be aware of. I've got two minutes left. When we look at these four different systems, tokenization, initial coin offering, smart contracts, three-dimensional data, we're able to actually find out that through blockchain technology, we're not only able to create a more transparent world, but we're able to actually better the systems and more efficient ways of doing things. And I'll give you an example with Chromium. Chromium is based on percentage, and that's how they tell the price of Chromium. So you've got Chromium at 40%, Chromium at 46%, and the price is determined based on that percentage. Now, using a tracking system that gives you the data automatically at that given time that the Chromium is washed or mined, you're able to actually create a coin that represents that data, and people are able to trade and interact with one another at a more transparent level because that data is now given at an instantaneous moment. Whereas the current situation, it is only the mind that knows that data, and only when they reveal the papers after they've tested, that's when you'd know. So the trading in itself can actually happen at an exponential rate where the whole world knows at the exact same time that the batch of chromium that's just been found sits at this percent. And that can be done through a blockchain system. And not only does blockchain help do that, it also helps make the process much more efficient and grow that market within that value chain. Because then different liquidity providers can then come onto that blockchain and actually better that system in a much better way. I've run out of time, but in conclusion, I want to make everybody aware that within the presidency, we're actively involved and engaging blockchain technology to better our country. Will it take time? Definitely. Do we have problems? Big problems. But are we engaging and making sure that we're working with these things definitely? And we cannot do it alone. And this is why we're, we're so excited to engage with conferences like these, because we're aware that it is through each and every person's involvement that the country can actually become a better place. So blockchain technology is a definite yes from the presidency of South Africa. Thank you very much. No, you're not escaping yet. I'm letting somebody ask a question. Anyone w would like to ask, ask a poor question? Yes, we've got one over there. Thank you. Hi. Is it on? Okay. Um, just a quick question. So it was mentioned yesterday about, um, you know, blockchain is only really a trustless system if we limit the human interaction from the starting point. When you talk about minerals, uh, I think the world also currently has a big distrust in Africa. Um, so if you're going to enter information about chromium's percentage and a human's going to enter it, how are we going to build that trust with the rest of the world that the, the information that's being loaded is correct and true? Very good question. Are we going to get the second question or should I answer the first one? No, you can. We, we're okay, only going to cool. take one. Okay, cool. You've asked a very good question, and, and that's some of the things that we're grappling with. So in Dubai, what they've done with their oil rigs is they've actually put a mechanism that tells you 
the, 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 so it separates the quantity of oil and water that they're actually getting from the rig. So that device actually tells you what's the quantity of oil or water that's being taken out at the time. You are very right in saying that in South Africa we've been riddled with corruption, etc. So how, how will the world then trust that the data we're putting on there is actually real? I guess that's, that's a market-related solution problem that the market will have to come with. But in all transparency, our aim is to try and get to the point where we, ha we don't have that. And that will have to be a regulation sort of point of view to say anybody who is that corrupt to do that should be um, put under the, the jurisdiction of the law. But the aim of it is to make sure that we get to that point where it is transparent to the point where nobody questions it. Um, and build that culture to say every mining house will have to be transparent about those things. So the aim is transparency, but we cannot ignore that corruption might be there and that will have to be dealt with with the law. Okay. And Paul, thank you. Thank you thank very you. much.